SpaceX is steadily closing in on Starship Flight 10, with preparations entering their final stages. Just a week ago, Super Heavy Booster 16 completed a full-duration static fire test, igniting all 33 Raptor engines. This test marked the final major milestone before the flight and confirmed the booster's readiness from a propulsion standpoint. Following the test, Booster 16 was removed from the orbital launch mount and transported back to the production site for final system checks, including electrical, hydraulic, and pneumatic verifications. The hot staging adapter will be installed in the coming days, bridging the interface between the booster and the upper stage for in-flight engine ignition. In a key update, SpaceX's Director of Starship Engineering, Shana Diaz, confirmed that Flight 10 will attempt a booster catch using the launch tower arms. Meanwhile, Ship 36, the upper stage that will ride atop Booster 16, is currently stationed inside Mega Bay 2 for engine installation and hardware modifications to address the failures observed in earlier missions. Specifically, engineers are correcting the propellant leak that occurred during Flight 9 and also addressing engine performance issues seen in Flight 7 and 8. Once engine integration is complete, Ship 36 will head to the Massey test site for a full-duration static fire to verify engine health and structural integrity and confirm that the fix has worked. Only after a successful static fire will the ship be cleared for flight. That said, hardware readiness isn't the only factor in play. The FAA must also complete its investigation into the Flight 9 anomaly and verify that SpaceX has addressed the root cause and implemented the necessary fixes. Much of this verification will hinge on Ship 36's upcoming static fire, which will act as a practical demonstration of corrective measures in action. Despite these hurdles, the outlook is promising. According to Sean Adias, the propellant leak discovered was minor and relatively easy to resolve, suggesting a quicker turnaround than Flight 9, which faced delays from major hardware upgrades and repeated testing. Elon Musk echoed that optimism, noting the next three Starship flights are spaced three to four weeks apart with Flight 10 potentially launching by month's end. On the ground side, the launch pad also sustained some damage during Flight 9, as expected. These kinds of high-thrust launches typically inflict wear on components like the booster quick disconnect. However, it appears that critical pad infrastructure was already repaired prior to Booster 16's recent static fire. The test's success essentially verified that these repairs were effective. More recently, scaffolding has gone up around the orbital launch mount, indicating that SpaceX teams are performing final structural checks and repairs. These efforts are expected to wrap up soon, which would bring the pad back to full operational readiness for Flight 10. The second launch pad has seen notable developments in recent days. Current hardware configurations indicate that it will feature dedicated booster quick disconnect systems, one each for delivering liquid methane and liquid oxygen to the booster stage. Markings on the launch mount clearly show the planned locations and spacing for these two connections. Several days ago, a protective steel hood was installed over the plumbing of one of these BQDs. This hood is designed to protect the propellant lines from the intense heat and force of Super Heavy's exhaust during ignition and liftoff. The hood for the second BQD was delivered to the launch site just recently and now stands ready for installation. Meanwhile, plumbing work inside the gantry continues, with careful installation of pipes, pumps, valves, and electrical cables. The launch mount's top deck is being outfitted with new water manifolds. One was fitted over a week ago and is now being integrated into the existing system. The final manifold, delivered Tuesday evening, will be installed in the coming days. These manifolds route water through internal ducts within the deck, releasing it during launch to absorb heat and dampen the intense acoustic energy from the booster engines. Steel plates are being installed over the concrete floor of the flame trench to cover the flame diverter. These plates provide an added layer of protection, shielding the diverter from the extreme thermal and mechanical stress generated during liftoff. Meanwhile, construction teams continue drilling works just outside the flame trench to install deep foundation piles. This work will support new concrete structures designed to handle the redirected exhaust flow after it exits the trench. Without this added protection, the sheer force and temperature of the plume could erode the surrounding terrain, especially with repeated launches. The most exciting developments are happening at the launch tower, where the chopstick arms have begun catch practice tests, preparing themselves for future rocket catch operations. According to Musk, the tower should be ready to attempt a Starship catch in two to three months, possibly as early as Flight 11, assuming Flight 10, which is expected to follow a similar mission profile as Flight 9, proceeds without issues. Over the past several months, the tower has undergone accelerated development, including multiple horizontal and vertical actuation cycles of the arms. 
This was followed by water bag load testing to simulate the weight of a returning vehicle and validate structural responses such as deflection, stress distribution, and joint deformation. The current testing phase involves raising the arms to the top of the tower and simulating catch sequences, effectively dry runs for the real thing. These tests are critical for refining both the software control algorithms and the mechanical responsiveness of the arms. The tower's ability to operate independently of the launch pad's readiness means that SpaceX could attempt a ship catch even if Pad B's systems are still under construction, provided the tower meets all safety and performance criteria. Given this, Musk's estimate of a two to three month readiness window seems realistic, potentially aligning with Flight 11, expected around August. So, what do you think? Will the first catch happen on Flight 11 or later? Let me know in the comments. Construction of the new Giga Bay is steadily advancing at the build site with current efforts centered on installing sheet piles. These interlocking steel walls act as foundational retaining structures, stabilizing the surrounding soil to enable safe deep excavation for concrete foundations and subgrade systems. A recent aerial image from RGV Aerial Photography offers a clear view of the area where Giga Bay's footprint is being established. Once the foundational works are complete, vertical construction will kick off. Giga Bay is planned as a high-throughput manufacturing hub for Starship, potentially producing over 1,000 units annually. The facility will integrate advanced tooling, automated welding, and supply chain systems under one roof to streamline Starship assembly at unprecedented rates. For a detailed breakdown of the goals and design of the Giga Bay project, check out my earlier video linked in the description. The Department of the Air Force recently released a draft environmental impact statement detailing SpaceX's ambitious plan to redevelop Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for Starship operations. Originally built in the early 1960s to support the Apollo program's early uncrewed missions, SLC-37 was later repurposed for Delta IV launches by United Launch Alliance from 2002 until the rocket's retirement in April 2024. After ULA stood down, NASA and the Space Force reassigned the site to SpaceX for Starship as part of efforts to maximize use of federal launch infrastructure and support national security and commercial launch needs. The EIS process, launched with a notice of intent in early 2024, has included environmental studies and public scoping, now culminating in this draft release. Key proposals include constructing two Starship launch pads, featuring launch towers, launch mounts, and flame deflector systems, modeled after the Pad B configuration at Starbase. Additionally, the company is evaluating the feasibility of adding two dedicated catch towers, designed specifically to recover super-heavy boosters and starships during landing operations, provided there's sufficient space at the site. Additional infrastructure will include systems for propellant production and storage, water and liquid nitrogen storage tanks, along with various utility and support facilities. The draft anticipates up to 76 Starship Super Heavy launches per year, each followed by separate landings of the booster and the upper stage, totaling up to 152 landings annually, in addition to static fire tests. To support the proposed launch rate and infrastructure build-out, the EIS analyzed environmental impacts across several categories, most of which were found to pose no significant concerns once mitigation strategies were accounted for. SpaceX has received limited site access at SLC-37 for preparatory work, starting with the demolition of legacy Delta IV infrastructure. Construction of the launch pad and support facilities is expected to follow later this year, with the first Starship launch from the site targeted for 2026. Meanwhile, over at LC-39A, construction of the Starship launch pad is progressing quickly. A new flame trench is currently being built, while integration work continues on the fully stacked launch tower. The launch mount and other key infrastructure components are under assembly at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, located just a few kilometers from the pad. In parallel, a new gigabay, similar to the one under construction at Starbase, is planned at Roberts Road. This facility will support on-site fabrication and assembly of Starship vehicles for future launches from both LC-39A and SLC-37. However, for initial flights from these pads, SpaceX will ship fully assembled Starships and Super Heavy boosters from Starbase. Alongside physical construction, an environmental impact statement is also in progress to evaluate and authorize up to 44 Starship launches per year from LC-39A. SpaceX now has five Starship launch pads across Starbase, Kennedy, and the Cape, spanning stages from active use to construction and early planning. And that number is only set to grow in the coming years as Elon Musk aims to scale up operations toward launching and landing multiple starships every single day. 
The EIS confirms SpaceX is still pursuing ocean landings for Starship and Super Heavy when a tower catch isn't viable due to mission constraints. After launching from SLC-37, the booster would separate and descend to a barge stationed in the Atlantic Ocean, at least five nautical miles offshore. Similarly, Starship returning from orbit or deep space missions would land on a floating platform somewhere between 55 degrees north and 55 degrees south latitude, depending on the mission profile. After landing, any residual propellants on board would be either vented into the atmosphere or burned off in a controlled fashion. The booster or ship would then be transported back to Cape Canaveral for inspection and refurbishment. Additional ocean landing sites are also under consideration, depending on changes to launch locations. From an engineering standpoint, this recovery method gives SpaceX more mission flexibility. Unlike a return-to-launch site maneuver, which demands substantial fuel to reverse the booster's trajectory back to the launch pad, an ocean landing allows the booster to follow a more direct descent path, conserving propellant and maximizing payload capacity to orbit. For Starship returning from orbital or interplanetary missions, landing back at the launch site is often impractical. After long-duration flights, such as those to the Moon or Mars, the vehicle may not have sufficient propellant reserves for a precise landing burn. Additionally, it may re-enter on a trajectory misaligned with the launch site, making the necessary orbital plane changes too propellant-intensive. These combined challenges make ocean platform landings a more viable alternative, offering a wider, more forgiving target zone with lower delta V requirements. Ocean platform landings also serve as practical training for off-world recovery, simulating conditions on planets like Mars where no landing infrastructure exists. Mastering precision landings in remote, infrastructure-free zones on Earth builds experience critical for future missions. To support this recovery mode, both Starship and Super Heavy are expected to be equipped with deployable landing legs, much like Falcon 9s, but likely redesigned to accommodate the larger structure and different touchdown dynamics. A glimpse of the future Starship leg mechanism was briefly shown during Elon Musk's recent company presentations. Interestingly, SpaceX had earlier acquired two offshore oil rigs, Phobos and Dimus, in 2020, intending to convert them into floating Starship launch and landing platforms. Initial modification work on the platforms started in 2021, aiming for a 2022 launch, but development halted early that year. Since then, there have been no major public updates, though development may resume based on future needs. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. A sudden and concerning propellant leak in the Falcon 9 rocket has forced SpaceX to delay the highly anticipated Axe 4 private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Organized by Houston-based Axiom Space, Axe 4 is the fourth in a series of commercial crewed flights to the ISS. Commanding the mission is Peggy Whitson, a former NASA astronaut and Axiom's director of human spaceflight, who holds the U.S. record for the longest cumulative time in space. She is joined by Group Captain Shubhanshu Shukla of the Indian Air Force, serving as the mission pilot. Shukla is also a trainee for ISRO's Gaganyaan Human Spaceflight Program and is set to become the first Indian astronaut to reach the ISS, and only the second Indian in space after Rakesh Sharma's 1984 mission to the Russian Salyut 7 space station. The crew also includes mission specialists Zawish Oznanski, Wisniewski, a Polish ESA astronaut and CERN engineer, and Tiber Kapu, a Hungarian mechanical engineer participating in Hungary's first astronaut mission since the Soviet era. Axe 4 was originally scheduled for launch from NASA's Kennedy Space Center on June 11. However, it was delayed following the detection of a liquid oxygen propellant leak in Falcon 9's first stage booster during a post-static fire inspection on June 8. SpaceX's VP of Build and Flight Reliability, William Gerstenmeier, stated that the leak had also occurred during the booster's previous Starlink mission in April, but was missed during refurbishment. SpaceX attempted to address the issue with a purge system, but could not implement it in time or effectively, leading to the launch delay. Additionally, engineers discovered a separate issue with the thrust vector control system on one of the booster's engines, necessitating component replacements. The overlooked oxygen leak highlights potential gaps in SpaceX's refurbishment and inspection processes, likely triggering a rigorous review of post-flight assessment procedures to prevent similar issues in future missions. The Falcon 9 is expected to be lowered into a horizontal position in the coming days, allowing technicians to access the propulsion bay, conduct thorough inspections, and carry out necessary repairs. Though time-consuming, this step is essential to ensure crew safety and mission reliability. Once the repairs and testing are complete, and pending range availability, SpaceX will announce a new launch date. After docking with the ISS, 
The crew will enter the station for a 14-day stay dedicated to an intensive research program. The mission includes 60 experiments, the highest number for any Axiom flight to date, covering areas such as human physiology in microgravity, microbial adaptation, and crop resilience in space. As SpaceX and its partners work to resolve the booster issues, the world waits for the next chapter in this unfolding story of exploration and innovation. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.